Hello, I'm Dr. Deepak Bhatt for ACC.org on day two of the ESC. It's been a wonderful meeting here. Lots of excitement, lots of energy. And uh, I'm back again with two good friends of mine, Gabriel Stegg and Paul Coley. Uh, let's go ahead and get started because once more, there was just a lot of trials to cover. We picked some that we thought were particularly interesting where there's been a lot of buzz and also ones where the speakers provided the slides ahead of time. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Gabriel, maybe we'll start with you with the Dankvas trial. I may not have pronounced that right, but you know what I mean. Yeah, Dankavas is a Danish community-based randomized control trial that looked at the value of screening for cardiovascular disease in primary prevention among uh, patients at moderate to high risk age 65 to 74. They started off enrolling men and women and ended up finally only keeping men in the program because they found out very quickly that the risk of women in that age range was so much lower than that of men that the trial would be futile if they had too many women. So uh, it looks like a sexist trial because there are only men, but it, they tried uh, at first to get both, both sexes enrolled and they eventually uh, focused on men. I just wanna say this because it came up in the discussion of the results. So what they did is they uh, offered to men aged 65 to 74 in selected cities in Denmark to come for screening for cardiovascular disease uh, with an EKG-gated non-contrast CT scan to detect coronary artery calcium, AFib, and aneurysms, uh, limp blood pressure measurements to detect PAD and hypertension, and a blood sample to detect diabetes and hypercholesterolemia. And then there was appropriate treatment offered to those patients who uh, had detection of abnormalities. So they offered screening to one third of the male population in that age range. And the two other thirds were not invited to screening and were uh, considered the control group. So this is the comparison between screened or at least offered screening and non-screened. It's a large study. Uh, they offered screening to 29,000 patients and their goal was actually a very ambitious goal. Maybe, and I'll, I'll say this, I think it was too ambitious because they, they were aiming to reduce all-cause mortality in a primary prevention setting, that's a, a big ask. Um, what they found uh, is uh, that um, the uh, uh, screening did not reduce all-cause mortality. Uh, there was actually um, a lower uh, all-cause mortality by 5%, 12.6 uh, versus 13.1, but of course that did not reach statistical significance. When they stratified the primary outcome by age though, they did find an 11% reduction in, in all-cause mortality, which was statistically significant in uh, patients between 65 and 69, and no difference at all uh, in patients in men between 70 and 74. When they looked at stroke, there was a hint of a signal, numerically uh, lower uh, with stroke with actually a significant p-value, 7% reduction, uh, a 9% lower rate of myocardial infarction, which did not reach statistical significance, and when they define post hoc a composite outcome, and frankly, I think that should have been their primary outcome. When they define a retrospective composite outcome of death, stroke, or MI, then they have a 7% statistically significant reduction in the screen group compared to the non screen group. And so I think that we should not write off screening for primary prevention in moderate to high risk patients. Uh, I think that trial might have been positive if the design had been different. And uh, uh, a community screening can be a useful way to address the, what remains the number one killer uh, in uh, uh, many areas in Western Europe, and certainly in Central, Eastern Europe, and North America. Great. No, thanks for that detailed explanation. I think there was a lot of uh, uncertainty about how to interpret it. That was helpful. Uh, speaking of uncertainty, Pyle, let's move on to the revived trial, where there's been a lot of discussion and debate about what the trial meant. And, and I'd like to really get your honest opinion about it. Having said that, uh, if what you say interventionists don't like, you, you might get a lot of hate mail. So <laughs> I am ready for that hate mail. But to <laughs> me, it was so interesting to see the results of this trial because it's turned on its head what I'm doing in clinical practice you know, every single day. So as you know, when we see ischemic heart disease and we see a reduced DF, we often think about revascularizing that ischemic heart disease, partly because data from the STITCH trial, which was a surgical revascularization with cabbage, showed a survival advantage at about 10 years. So this trial really asked the question is, does that really extrapolate to percutaneous coronary interventions or PCIs, which we often do. So it took patients with an ejection fraction less than or equal to 35%, 
the patients had to have extensive CAD, but it had to be amenable to PCI. And here's the kicker. They had to have a viable myocardium. So it had to have some evidence of myocardial viability. And then they got randomized to either just get optimal medical therapy, which included heart failure management, including device therapy, or to get PCI of essentially all of their stenotic lesions and optimal medical therapy. Um, 700 patients, median follow-up was 41 months, and the median age was about 70. Mm -hmm. And the results to me really were very surprising because there was no additional benefit um, over goal-directed medical therapy or optimal medical therapy in patients with severely reduced ejection fraction and extensive coronary disease. Now, I mentioned the STITCH trial because it often gets compared to that, um, but the follow-up here was 41 months as opposed to the STITCH trial where we really saw that survival advantage emerging at 10 years. I also personally thought it was interesting that you're not really paying a price to do the PCI. There was not a signal for harm. There was no increases in MIs occurring early. And there was actually no difference in ejection fraction either in either of the two arms, suggesting that revascularizing that myocardium is not adding a lot of benefit on top of that really good background medical therapy that we have. So to me, this is really a you know, home run for medical therapy, I would say. We still need the interventionalists like you, Deepak, to mm -hmm. save the day when we have our acute coronary events but it doesn't necessarily mean we rush every ischemic patient to the cath lab that has a chronic ischemic cardiomyopathy because we're not really doing a lot of benefit on top of the great heart failure meds that we have. Yeah, that's a beautiful synthesis, I think, of the data. Uh, Gabriel, in a line, can you just tell us uh, your top line thoughts? Yeah, well, I was, I have to say, I have to confess, I was really surprised with the result. Um, I did not expect this. I, I'll remind many of you that um, in the ischemia trial, there was actually a subgroup that appeared to derive benefit on outcomes from uh, uh, an in invasive approach, and that was the group that had left ventricular dysfunction. So I would have expected that a similar type of design, which is what Revive did, would have yielded benefit, but that was not borne out in the prospective randomized trial. I also point out that the trial uh, had trouble recruiting. It was very slow in enrolling, and uh, one can wonder whether, first of all, they didn't reach their goal for enrollment and whether maybe some patients may have been triaged out of randomization before randomization, either because they were referred to surgery or because they were considered really candidates for medical therapy and that whether they, that may have skewed the sample that was offered randomization. Uh, I think that we need to read the paper in, in more detail and dig into the data to better understand this. Uh, but that being said, uh, it's a tough pill to swallow for us interventionalists, but I think it's a, it's a pill that makes us, uh, we have to think more about the indications for revascularization in, in, uh, in patients with stable disease. It's, it's becoming apparent that really most of the benefit of revascularization is either in patients with ACS or to control symptoms, but in patients who are asymptomatic and are stable, uh, probably our indications should be really minimal. Yeah, no, really great uh, thoughts and comments. You know, when I first got to the Cleveland Clinic, I remember one of the older surgeons there that did a lot of high-risk cabbage on patients with OV dysfunction said to me, never send patients to cabbage. It might have been PCI with a diminished LV function and multivessel disease with the hope of improving their LV function unless they have a ton of angina. He said that was the only time he ever saw improvements in the app. Anecdotal medicine, but... Uh, makes you wonder whether all the fancy non-invasive testing and triaging and revascularization based on that is really helping or not. But at any rate, uh, let's move on to the next trial. And Gabriel, if you can just, uh, in a, a couple of uh, uh, sentences, tell us what the ad hoc trial was and what the bottom line finding was. Yes, that's another interesting uh, pra practical finding. Uh, it's a Belgian trial that looked at acetazolamide, which is a fairly old uh, diuretic that we've had for a long time to help with congestion treatment in, in patients with acute heart failure. So um, the idea is that loop diuretics uh, become ineffective, as we know, after a while, or poorly effective at uh, the treatment of acute congestion in patients who uh, uh, have acute heart failure, and that maybe it, it might be possible to speed up um, uh, the decongestion uh, and therefore shorten lengths of stay uh, and maybe improve the outcomes of these patients. So what the investigators did was to do a re relatively small a randomized trial of acet acetazolamide IV or placebo in patients who had heart failure, um, signs of congestion, 
elevated uh, uh, BNP or anti-poor BNP, and who were on IV furosemide or loop diuretics. And to make a long story short, again, they found that there was much quicker and much more effective decongestion uh, with acetazolamide compared to placebo, and that this resulted in dramatic shortening of the length of stay. There was no improvement, however, in the long-term outcomes in these patients and no prevention of recurrence of heart failure. But again, diuretics are not intended for that. That's the long-term background therapy of heart failure with the four pillars of treatment that are intended to do this. But for the acute treatment for patients who are in the, in the CCU or who just had pulmonary edema, it's clear that we can alleviate the congestion much more quickly with this. And again, there were no major side effects from that treatment. So I think this is potentially something that will change our practice. Terrific. Uh, Paul, can you just uh, give us a line about the all heart trial, what it was and what it found? Absolutely. So we've been, you know, toying with the idea of allopurinol in heart disease for a long time. So this asks the question of allopurinol and cardiovascular outcomes in ischemic heart disease patients without underlying gout over the age of 60. And the short answer is really no benefit um, for three-point mace, for more of an extended mace, and across the subgroups, there was really no benefit, despite reducing the uric acid. Um, there were no serious adverse events. However, allopurinol appeared pretty safe. Um, but for me, this means I'm probably not going to be reaching for that allopurinol very often. Yeah, no, that's uh, really quite true. And, and Paul, maybe you can help finish things off here with the DELIVER trial, which is obviously a major study presented here. Big study here, Deepak. And, you know, the SGLT2 inhibitors seem to dominate every meeting. And this is no different because they're such home run medications. In fact, at this meeting, we saw some biomarker data as well about proteomics and how SGLT2 inhibitors may work uh, through changing the protein levels. But the DELIVER trial was a trial of dapagliflozin in patients uh, with heart failure and LV ejection fraction greater than or equal to 40%. So this was a combination of, you know, HEF PEF and and heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. And they were randomized to either DAPA-10 or uh, placebo with a median follow-up of 2.3 years. And what we saw is, you know, we've obviously seen the results uh, with dapagliflozin before with reduced ejection fraction, but we see that, you know, even in preserved ejection fraction or across the spectrum, really, there is a significant benefit on MACE. Um, so the heart failure uh, and cardiovascular death endpoint was reduced by 18%. Heart failure by itself was 21%, and cardiovascular death was also positive at 12%. So to me, you know, the idea of using SGLT2 inhibitors kind of across the spectrum of ejection fraction has become a common part of my clinical practice. And in fact, there are other DAPA studies that have also come out at ESC that have looked at, you know, background frailty, um, background atrial fibrillation level, uh, background levels of natriuretic peptides. And regardless of kind of who the patient population is, the effect size and the benefit really appears to be consistent. Yeah, no, uh, terrific summary. Okay, Rilla, do you think we have enough data about SGLT2 inhibitors yet? Well, we have so much data. It's amazing. I um, mean, all the trials piling up. Um, I'd add for the anecdote that what was impressive with DELIVER is not only the, main, the results of the main trial, but also the anecdote that the DELIVER investigators were able to publish simultaneously with the primary paper, nine additional papers in major medical journals at the same time during the meeting. Uh, I, I think, as far as I know, this is unprecedented. We have ten <laughs> papers uh, published simultaneously in the main in the same meeting, uh, with various meta-analyses and secondary analyses. Uh, by the way, again, um, all uh, analyses go in the same direction. Benefit seems to be remarkably consistent across outcomes, across patient types, and consistent between various molecules, trials, and types of patients. So. It is, it is something that really we, we must now totally implement in our clinical practice. It's a major benefit. And we have to stop thinking of SGLT2s as drug for diabetes or glucose. These are major cardiovascular agents. Yeah, no, I think you're right. A major scientific accomplishment and also a major academic accomplishment. I think the three of us have got to work on a trial and try to get 10 papers out at once sometime. Well, <laughs> uh, wonderful speaking with you both. Thank you to the audience at home. Join us for the day three wrap up.